All right, we're going to study God's Word, so if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and open that up to the New Testament book of 1 John. We're continuing to walk through the book of 1 John. If you're a guest with us this morning, uh, that's what we've been studying through. By the way, welcome. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're so overjoyed that you're here, that you would spend this time with us this morning. And uh, we love God's Word here at the Church of Brook Hills. We, we want to live our lives completely shaped by the authoritative, beautiful, good truth that is in God's Word and His Word alone. So that's why we give ourselves to the study of His Word Sunday after Sunday. All right, 1 John chapter 2, we'll pick up at the end of chapter 2, beginning in verse 28, if you'd follow along as I read. So now... Little children, remain in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well, that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed, that is Jesus, so that he might take away sins and there is no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. It's the present continuous verb, meaning doesn't continue to give themselves to a life of sin. Everyone who sins in that same way has not seen him or known him. Children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is righteous, the one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin, the same present continuous verb, because his, that is God's seed, remains in him. He's not able to sin because he's been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. So Christianity is new birth. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. So Christianity is new birth into a new family. But here's the challenge is ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, our first parents in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, family has has borne the marks of brokenness. Right? There would be stories even in this room of, of broken families. And so with that broken family backdrop, it can make it difficult sometimes for us to think of God as our father and of our being his children and that creating warm feelings. It doesn't necessarily create warm feelings immediately for everybody depending on what you've seen and what you've experienced. I read a, a story just came out last week in the Huffington Post about a, a girl named Brescia Meadows, and she endured unspeakable acts that were committed against her since she was eight years old by her father. Horrible things. And then her father was also physically abusive to her mom, and she saw no, no way out. Matter of fact, the last thing she said that I remember thinking was, quote, it's never going to stop. It's only going to get worse. And those were the last thoughts that came into her mind before she pulled the trigger and shot her father and killed him at the age of 14. Family's broken. Author Jackie Hill Perry is a Christian author who shares her story of, of deep brokenness and then also just unbelievable, glorious redemption in her book, Gay Girl, Good God. And she says, even when I was a young child, in pre-K, she said, I started to see contradictions between other people's stories and my story. 
She said, and, and the way that I saw the difference between my story and other people's stories is through the books that were read to us in pre-kindergarten. She said she realized Dick and Jane had a father at home. Jackie didn't. Dick and Jane had a father to tuck them in at night. Jackie didn't. Dick and Jane woke up and ate breakfast with him. Jackie didn't. She said, Jackie's father came to visit him, visit her, and she said, sometimes. And then increasingly, he stopped visiting. And here's what she wrote. Wanting to save me from another disappointed sadness, my mother stopped getting me dressed for his arrival. She was unwilling to participate in my heartbreak, so she stopped telling me about his promises altogether. She'd grown tired of watching me stare at a closed door, legs swinging to a stop, because I'll be there in 30 minutes eventually became a knock never heard. So much brokenness as we come to this text that's saying, look, we have a father. And it doesn't necessarily register with the same impact in everybody's life depending on the story, right? Our church cares as a church, a local church, the Church of Brook Hills, we care deeply about adoption and foster care. That, that touches so many lives. We have so many stories of adoption and foster care all around this church, all over this room. Matter of fact, in two weeks, we're going to spend time in our prayer of intercession time. That time is going to be focused on praying toward adoption and foster care, the orphan crisis all around the world. This is something that's passionate in our hearts as a church. But that ministry is embedded in a larger reality, and it's embedded in the larger reality that's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christianity is a new family. It's a new father. We put our trust in Jesus Christ, and we have a father in heaven. And Jesus said, I'm going to teach you to pray. And the first thing you say, he said to his disciples, is say, our father who's in heaven. And this father, as you read through the New Testament, is glorious. He is perfect. He is everything good fathers give a glimpse of. And he is the total opposite and contradiction of everything that is broken and evil in a world of broken fatherhood. He's perfect in all of his ways. He provides all that we need. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He never misuses his children. He's crazy about his kids. (laughs) And that changes everything. You believe that, and that changes everything. So three truths here about the new life that we have as children of God. The first point is this, we're loved. As children of God, we are Loved by the Father. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. See what great love. The older translations used to say, behold. Right, it, was, it was making a big deal. Behold. Here's the unveiling. What great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And John says with exclamation, and we are. That is, God the Father loved us by bringing us into his family. This is more than, more than just courtroom motif, which is so frequently talked about. It is a glorious truth in the New Testament. But it's more than the courtroom motif. It's, it's God who sheds the, the robe of the judge and adopts the sinner as his own. It's glorious, glorious truth. God is designated in this letter. This is a short letter. And God is designated as Father 12 times in this letter. J.I. Packer said famously, Father is the Christian name for God. This is in your notes. John's favorite descriptions of believers are children, little children, and dear friends. Over and over, 18 times, over and over. And that dear friends is the word agape toy. It has the word agape in it. It means one's loved, dear ones, dear friends, Beloved one. So just real fast, just to get a, a sense of this. I'm not going to take you through every occurrence of those words, but just look at chapter 2 and let these words leap off the page. Verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children. Verse 7. Dear friends. Again, that's that word agape toy or beloved. Verse 12. I am writing to you little children. Verse 14. I have written to you children because you've come to know the Father. Verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. So even in the midst of these kind of tests of faith, which we've talked about for the last two weeks, the signs of life, the love test and the obedience test, right, and the truth test, 
even in the midst of these kind of scans that 1 John is doing on the, the profession of the believer, there is this tenderness in John's language. He's not trying to rob anybody's assurance. He keeps saying, children, little children, children of God, you have a father, you're loved by him. You know, it can be, um, it can be tempting as a pastor to aim your preaching at, mainly at the people that you think are playing games, playing religious games. And that, that would affect your tone. If you're talking to the people who aren't listening, then that's going to affect the tone. It's going to ring harsh. It's going to be edgy. It's going to be shaking up, right? Because that's who you're talking to. But John isn't mainly talking to the ones who need shaking up. He's talking to the ones who need assurance. They need security. They need him to say, hey, I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you do know the truth, and I want you to remain in it. You've heard it. You know it. You have an anointing from the Spirit, and it's going to remain in you. I'm writing to you fathers. I'm writing to you children. I'm writing to you little children. There's this tone of pastoral care. Your sins have been forgiven, he says in chapter 2. Think about it with me. It's in your notes. The Father's love overcomes our past. Overcomes our past. The gospel message is that God has acted in Christ to overcome our sin, to rescue us from our sin and our brokenness through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. That's the central message of the Bible, the central message that we call the gospel, the good news of Christian faith. And so when we trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, from that time forward, John says in chapter two, early in chapter two, from that time forward, we have an advocate with the Father And the advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And and if that inclines you for a moment to say, well, then Jesus is more gracious than the Father. Remember, it was the Father's plan to send the Son. They were not pulling in different directions. It was the Father's idea from the beginning that the Son would be slain, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. It was the Father's plan to save you. It was the Father's plan to save you through the death of His Son. It was the Father's plan to bring you all the way into His household, all the way into His forever family. God, the Father, is to be praised. What does that mean for us as believers in Christ? It means this. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, and hopefully, if you're a believer, you've experienced that, and there's more coming, by the way. <laughs> I hope that's not bad news, right? This is, what, this is what he does. He's showing us things in our life that are, that are destroying us, that are eating us from the inside. And so the Spirit's gonna convict us of that. But here's, here's how that interacts with and interfaces with the truth that God is our Father and he loves us, is when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, We're not meant to be paralyzed by guilt or paralyzed by shame. We don't run the other way. We run to the Father. (laughs) We run into the arms of the Father and we say, I'm sorry, please help me. Please help me. I was reminded about a meme that was generated uh, some weeks back, maybe months ago. And it said this. I think we've got it. Religion says... I messed up, my dad's gonna kill me. The gospel says, I messed up, I need to call my dad. Right, you see the difference. The love of the Father drives us into his arms when we've sinned against God. So when the New Testament talks about God declaring us righteous, so this is kind of theology quiz moment, that's the doctrine of justification. So God declaring us righteous righteous because of the merits of Christ and what Christ accomplished in his living and dying, and he justifies us. He says that our sins have been forgiven and we're declared righteous. If you're unfamiliar with that truth, if, this, if that's the first thing you've ever heard of it, then you can read a little book, really helpful little book that explains it. It's called The Bookends of the Christian Life by Jerry Bridges and Bob Bevington, a sweet little book, and it'll t- teach you about what Scripture says about justification. Our biggest problem as humans coming into this world is that we've sinned against God and that the wages of sin is death. So that our sins 
expose us to the judgment of a holy and just God. That is our biggest problem. That is the biggest threat. And God answers our biggest problem in the gospel by sending his one and only son, Jesus, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross as a substitute for us, to take our judgment in his body on the tree so that all those who believe on Christ, our sins were transferred to him and his righteousness is transferred to us. This has for centuries been called by the church the great exchange. He gets our sins. We run off with his righteousness. It is is scandalously good news, this gospel is, right? That's justification by faith alone. But here's the next point. The Father doesn't just make us right. That's justification. He makes us His. That's adoption. He brings us into His family. He gives us the family name. That's what baptism is. I baptize you into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You've got His name now. You've got His identity. You belong to Him. You, uh, you, you want a glimpse of the love of God the Father? Um, think about, just by way of analogy, here's a glimpse. Think about what you dote over. Think about what you delight in, right? Some of you, it's, it's a niece or nephew, and you are just totally smitten by this little toddler, right? Or maybe it's not even a toddler, they're just kind of chewing on their hand and just saliva all over, and somehow that's just amazing to you, right? You totally don't, maybe you, you might dote over, some of you, the way you look at your dog, right? It, there is a special way you look at, and more perplexing still, the way some of you look at your cats, Right, that is proof that this is a fallen world. The way you look (laughs) with such (laughs) sweetness. (laughs) Yeah, we brought we brought our first child home from the hospital, and we just turned on the camcorder and filmed him for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and all he's doing is just chewing on his hand, thumb in his eye. We're like, huh, he's so gifted, right? He's so Kids can't stick their thumb in their eye at this age. Like, he's so advanced. (laughs) One of the books that my wife and I read aloud together um, some years back is called Love Walked Among Us by an author named Paul Miller, who I love. Um, I'd just buy it. If he wrote a book called How to Make a Hamburger, I'd buy it, and it would be sweet and life-changing. He wrote this book called Love Walked Among Us, and... um, and in it, he tells a story about his wife, Jill. He tells multiple stories about his family. He tells a story about his wife, Jill, who uh, bought a donkey. And he says this, Sometimes I'll see Jill resting on the fence, smiling, just looking at the donkey. <laughs> I think it is the big, soft ears that get her. At least Jill told me that if I had big, soft ears, she'd look at me the same way. <laughs> Now he's going to pivot. When I see Jill enjoying her donkey, I get a glimpse into God's heart. Because of Jesus' death, God leans against the fence, looks at me with a smile of pure delight on his face. Is that how you think of God? You're in Christ. Is that the way that you think of God? That's why John says, do you see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we would be called children of God. Look, he's 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Everybody's dead. He's the last man standing. His brother got beheaded 30 years ago. Peter's gone. All of the disciples who walked with Jesus on the beach, all the 12, they're all dead. And 60 years later, he's not crusty in his faith. He is not wrapped in formalism. He is like... It's like he saw it for the first time. Have you seen what manner of love? It's the same word that's used when, uh, when Jesus stills the storm and the disciples look at him and say, what manner of man? It's the exact same word. It literally means from what country? Where, where, where do you see anything like this in this world? This is otherworldly. It's from another country. It's from another place. The kind of love that God has given to us that we would be called his children. John is 60 years in and he's still wrapped. He's still enthralled and he's saying, you've got to see this. The love that God has given to us. 
the love our Father has shown us in Christ. Have you seen it? Have you experienced the love that John is talking about, the love that we're talking about this morning? If you want to, you can. If you want to see it, you can see it. If you, if you want to, I've got a hunch that God is already seeking you. I, if you want to, I've got a hunch that the reason you want to is because God is already seeking you this morning. You showed up on the wake-up list this morning, and he's running after you. That's why C.S. Lewis called our search for God the mouse's search for the cat. He's, he's pursuing us. When we find ourselves pursuing him, he was already pursuing us. That's why John says we love him because he first loved us. He seeks us that we might seek him. And so I would say to you today, put your trust in Christ. Run to this one savior of the world. The day that you realize how great the love of God is for you and me in Christ, that's the day your life starts changing. John believes it with all of his heart. He's experienced it these past 60 years. That leads us to the next truth. God's children are loved and God's children are changed. God's children are changed. So up until this point, John has described Christians, followers of Jesus, as those who know God, as those who are in Christ, as those who walk in the light, as those who remain in the Father. This is the first time in John's letter that he speaks of Christians as those in chapter 2, verse 29, who are born of him, who are born of God. And then look at chapter 3, verse 9. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed, God puts a seed somewhere deep inside and it remains in him. He's not able to sin because he has been born of God. Now, Look, when you look at all those verses about, you know, the one who's been born of God does not sin, that can lead you, if, you're, if we're not careful, to just kind of run into what's called Christian perfectionism. The idea that if you really arrive, if you truly get to this point of absolute surrender to Jesus, sin goes away forever, and you live a totally sinless life, and they'll put their finger on verses like this and say, well, what does the text say? It says that those who are born of him do not sin. So I'm just saying what the Bible says. Again, those verbs are present tense continuous. It's those who keep on, go on sinning. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. So when John says the one born of God does not sin, and he goes on to say is not able to sin, let me ask you a question. Does that mean that the Christian gets to a place where he or she never sins? And the answer is no. No. And the answer comes from the Bible itself. Matter of fact, you don't even have to leave 1 John to get the answer, to hear Scripture interpret itself. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John 1, verse 8. Same author, obviously. He says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if we say we don't have sin, we're lying. We're deceiving ourselves. John is saying we we do have sins. And he says, but we have somewhere to go with our sins. He says in the very next verse, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that pattern keeps happening throughout the course of the Christian's life. John is talking about a lifestyle of sin where a person who claims to follow Jesus doesn't care about God's command, says obedience, schmobedience, I don't care what the Bible says, I wanna do this, and I'm gonna do this. And John says, no, because God puts a seed inside. The day that you're reborn, there's a seed inside your heart, and your want to's been tweaked. If I can put it in theological terms, it, it would go like this. God always sanctifies those whom he justifies. He always sanctifies those whom he justifies. So that means that he accepts us, that's justification, he accepts us in Christ, and then he sets about transforming those he has accepted. He accepts us, he takes us as we are, he doesn't leave us as we are. He takes us, accepts us, and then he starts his work of transformation, making us more and more like Jesus Christ. He's transforming us. So think of new birth 
as new sheet music. Think of new birth as new sheet music. So we come into the world playing one song. And we're humming that song every moment of our lives. We're humming that song in in our words, in our actions, in our motives. It's that song that's just playing as a background track for our life. And then God saves you, and it's sort of like the record's, the record stops, and there's a new track for your life. It's not the song that it was before. There's a new melody. You're not going to play that new melody perfectly. Matter of fact, there might be certain times where you even occasionally revert to playing the old melody. So much of Scripture talks about that. Put off, put off what is evil in you and put on Christ Jesus. That's that language of you reverted to the old melody line. Come on, that's not who you are. You've got a new identity. You've got a new song to sing. You've got a new melody that's been put in your heart by God. So, but even when we do play the melody as best we can, we sometimes flub the notes That's the reality of of sin, indwelling sin in the life of the the believer. So when John says that the person born of God has God's seed remaining in him, in chapter 3, verse 9, you see that there, God's seed remains in him. One of the things that John means by that is, Christian friend, you can't even enjoy sin the way you did before. I hope that resonates with you. You can't enjoy it the way you did before. The 17th century Puritans used to say that the Christian cannot even sin but with a secret reluctance. There's something deep in the soul of the believer. It's what John calls the seed. This seed has been put there so that even when you sin, you say like Paul, I'm doing the things I hate. I hate this. Why am I doing this? This is wrong. This is not who I am anymore. This is not my identity. This tastes bitter now. It tastes bitter even in this moment. I can't enjoy it the way that I did before I knew Christ. You've been ruined for this world. You've been claimed by God. You have a new want to. Christian, please please hear me. So, So John talks about Satan a lot in this letter. He, he calls him the devil, it means the slanderer, means the liar, means the accuser. He talks a lot about the work of the devil, right? There's an enemy of your soul. This is an article of faith. There's an enemy of your soul, and he wants you in bondage. He wants to sear your conscience. This coming week, it's his agenda. That's his, he digs into his folio. That's what he's at, into. That's what he wants to do. He wants to sear your conscience. He wants you to believe porn is going to satisfy you. He wants you playing religious games and thinking you're safe. He wants your ego to be huge, to turn your life in on yourself so that you live for your own ends and everybody else dances to your music, right? That, that's what he wants. He wants you watering the seeds of bitterness this week, seeds of unforgiveness. He wants you pouring water on that. He's there to help. That's his agenda. Suffering believer, he wants you to curse God. So what do you have? Do you have any resources against him? Christian, John, is running in as a pastor and he's saying, don't dumb down your salvation. Jesus, in your notes, came to destroy what's killing us. He came to destroy what's killing us. Jesus doesn't sit passively while sin attacks the soul of the Christian. He's given us his spirit and even the power of his cross. Look at chapter three, verse eight. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. In other words, Jesus didn't die merely to change courtroom paperwork in heaven. 
He died to expose the lies and deception that you and I had bought into before we knew Christ. He died to take you by the hand and lead you into freedom, right? More and more into freedom. He died to take you there. He said, whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Not as a zap, it's not a light switch, but increasingly the truth breaking in on the soul of the believer is making us, by the work of the Holy Spirit, more and more free, as the Puritan said in the 1640s, so that we are able to die more and more to sin and live more and more to righteousness. It's a glorious thing. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we are being transformed. We are being changed to be more like Christ. But here's the next point. God doesn't make you like Jesus without involving you. It's not another utterly passive thing. It's warfare. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 13 If you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If you, by the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. He's not taking us off the hook. He's leaving us in the battle right there in the war. Read Romans chapter 6 for this, right? Present the parts of your body as instruments of righteousness now because you can. And he says, because you are no longer under the dominion of sin. Sin will no longer call the shots. It can't jerk your chain anymore. You're under a new master now. It's not enough warfare in the Christian life today, right? We expect victory uh, to show up like things we buy on Amazon. You know, you click the thing and then you go outside and there's the package, right? That's, That's not Christian faith. It's a war. God says, take every thought captive to obey Christ. You, he's saying, he's not kidding. You, take that thought and bring it into servitude under my word in the power of my spirit. You're not gonna do that on on your own or in your own strength. I'm gonna give you the power of my spirit to enable you to subjugate that thought to the truth of my word. Put on, Paul says in Ephesians 6, Put on the full armor of God. You start dressing up. That stuff, that's for you. You need to get it on post haste. Get it on, all of it. The sword, the breastplate, the shoes, the whole thing. Armor up. We're called to this, right? You're not going to be free from materialism without giving. That's in the Bible for a reason. You're not going to experience freedom from anxiety without prayer. You're not going to experience freedom from addiction without biblical fellowship and confession of sin and friends who will encourage you and accountability. You need this stuff. It's not just add-on extras that nobody needs. It's in the Bible for a reason. And apparently the false teachers in John's day and in their time, one of the things that they were slinging out was this idea that you can be indifferent to sin. That's why John keeps hammering on this same issue over and over and over. Some of you maybe need to realize this morning, maybe the Holy Spirit's gonna put his finger on this in your own life. You've made a peace accord with sin. You're not falling into it anymore. You built a diving board. It's intentional now. It's a way of life now. One of the evidences that you're a Christian is the Holy Spirit in moments like this as we look at his word is gonna say, yeah, that's you and here's the area. And maybe he's saying that all across the room. Here's the area. I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you friends. Let's do this. He keeps convicting us and reminding us sin cannot satisfy us. So God's children are loved. God's children are being changed. And God's children are looking. Loved, changed, and looking. Looking to what? Looking eagerly toward the return of Jesus. Here's how the Christian life is lived. It is lived by faith. The Christian life is lived eyes up and eyes out. It's lived trusting God, trusting that his promises are real, that you can bank your life on them. You can stake your life on the promise of God, that his commands are best for you, that they'll lead to flourishing. Obedience to his commands will only lead you to flourishing and joy. 
It's trusting that our suffering won't have the last word. That's how we step, one step after another. We talked a couple weeks ago about uh, the controlling metaphor of the Christian life being walking with Christ, one foot in front of the other. It's repentance and faith. It's laying aside, Hebrews chapter 12, laying aside every sin that so easily entangles us and looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's how we walk, step by step. But ultimately, in a bigger sense, we live all of life ultimately with our eyes on eternity, not on this world. Malcolm Muggeridge said famously that the ultimate disaster that can befall us as Christians is to think ourselves at home here on earth. We live daily with our eyes fixed on the reality that Jesus Christ is returning in glory, in majesty. He will return to judge and to save. He will return to judge those who have rejected God's claims on their lives. He will return to save those who have found refuge in Christ alone as Savior and Lord. That day is coming. That day sends the believer forward in obedience and mission. That drives the life of the believer. But that day, Christ's return, will be a day of incredible, tremendous shame for many people all over the world. They will look, as the scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. There will be two radically alternate responses when we see Jesus on that day. Shame and joy. Some will, as Revelation says, will call for the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the glory of this one. And others, John says, long for his appearing and look and see their redemption draws nigh. Think about shame. You ever, um, you ever feel unpresentable? That's what shame will do. You, you feel unpresentable. I, uh, I, when I was in high school, um, some friends, with my parents' permission, staged a kidnapping of me at 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it was going to be guys and notably girls were all going to pour into my room at 3 a.m. in the morning and blindfold me and kidnap me bring me to one of their friend's houses, the parent's house, and just have fun and stuff. And so, um, good news, I found out. So I knew that they were coming. So I I set my alarm for 2.50 a.m. And I made myself presentable, right? It was was a blessing because I had genuinely slept, so I knew my eyes are going to be sleepy. If I set my alarm for 10 minutes before, my eyes will still look sleepy, so it won't be totally fake. I was sleeping 10 minutes ago, right? And so I set my alarm, you know, that way they didn't come in and I was in some embarrassing PJs that my mom should have told me not to wear that night or, or you know, I wasn't, didn't have my mouth hanging open, snoring. You know, there wasn't something like that that happened. So as they came in, I'm fake sleeping at three o'clock in the morning. They pour, I'm like, oh, what are you doing here? You know, I'm, all this. And as they whisk me away, I'm fake protesting with like minty fresh breath. Because I had literally just brushed my teeth right before, <laughs> right before they came in the door, right? I was ready. I was presentable. Shame feels like I'm not presentable. I'm not presentable. Shame, shame feels like I'm not presentable to others. I'm not presentable to God. I've, I've done things. And so I'm not presentable. Or things were done to me, and so I'm not presentable. Or there's something associated with me, and so I'm not presentable. And because of that, I feel exposed, I feel humiliated. I love this truth. Christianity is not a shaming religion. It is not a shaming religion. What God holds out to believers in this text takes you all the way to the end of your story on the day when so many will look at Christ's return and feel incredible 
paralyzing shame. But look at verse, chapter 2, verse 28. He front loads it in the passage that we read. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. What shocking words. Even at the coming of the Holy One, we will not be ashamed, but we will be confident. Finally, you are here. We were waiting. We were looking. We were anticipating. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, we are God's children now. Who knows what we're going to be, right? Only God knows what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know this, that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Eschatology, it's a big $3 word. It means the study of the end times, the study of last things. Eschatology or end times theology is not meant to make us arrogant, as it so often does. End times theology is not to be done in the spirit of kind of the weather forecaster, sort of distantly drawing pictures and charts on the board. It's not meant to do that. Eschatology done right, John says, makes us pure. We have this hope, and this hope is purifying us, even as he is pure. This hope is changing us. We're looking at him, and it's already having an impact on our lives. It creates a sense of eagerness and even confidence that when he returns, all will be well. Brooke Hills, so I have a passion for you as your pastor. And there's no passion that I have that more than this, that you would be ready when he returns. That on that day, when the trumpet sounds and Jesus Christ, the glorious one, breaks through the eastern skies, the Lord that we worshiped, when he appears again in the second advent, I want every member of the church of Brook Hills to be ready, to be confident. (laughs) No shame, here he comes. Carpet's been rolled out. Come get us. Ransom your people. We welcome you because we've longed for you. We welcome you because we've lived for you. We welcome you because you have loved us perfectly in Christ. As the old hymn said, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness. You're presentable dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. I don't know about you, but, um, but I get tired. Right? I get tired of the constant evil in this world, the kind of things we saw in the news that we were praying for this week and shook our city, and you see that junk Day after day, week after week, it's all around the world. I get tired of my own sin, the battle against my own sin. How easy it is to sin, right? Does that ever make you tired? It's so easy to be bitter. It's so easy, right? I hate how divided my heart is. I hate my sin. Most of the time I can say I hate my sin. Other times I don't hate my sin, and I hate that. I hate all that's still unchristlike about me 38 years after I met Christ. I hate introspection. It eats my lunch sometimes. I hate introspection. I hate that I have to think about the battle and that think of, thinking about the battle leaves me discouraged. I hate that. And that's why I'm so often moved when we're remembering these kinds of truths when we're singing these kinds of truths. On that day, when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face. Full arrayed in blood-washed linen, how I'll sing thy sovereign grace. 
or when this poor, lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter tongue, I'll sing thy power to save. We're looking. We're loved. We're changed. We're looking. So three things, real quick. Brooke Hills, three things. One, cultivate holy habits. Cultivate holy habits. So, There's no spiritual formation without repetition. You just think about this. We embrace repetition in every other area of our lives, and we see it as a good thing. We embrace repetition to hone your golf swing. You embrace repetition to improve your musicianship, to improve your abilities in mathematics. We do repetition over and over in every realm of life, but here. Here we think, no, it's just a checklist. It's not going to do us any good. No, reading the Bible is not going to do you any good. (laughs) And reading it tomorrow and the next day and the next day is not going to do you any good. You've got to be crazy. Read The New Testament talks to us about the kinds of things that make us strong by the grace of God. Prayer, his word, his people, gathered worship, community, relationships. What area is most neglected right now in your life? Think about that. Maybe that's an application point for you. What area is most neglected in your life right now. One author said it so well, if the sovereign Lord has created us as creatures of habit, why should we think repetition is opposed to our spiritual growth? So cultivate holy habits. Two, study the grace of God. By that I mean know what scripture teaches about your salvation, about God's rescue mission. So, Don't hear me sending you out on this kind of moral crusade, moralistic introspection, because God God isn't sending you there. John isn't sending you there. I'm inviting you here to remember the good news repetitively. Keep remembering the good news. And then third, savor the return of Christ. Savor the return of Christ. Keep your eyes on that day, and that will have a purifying effect, John says, on your life. You can have confidence that when he returns, you will not look away in shame. You will boldly look on your Redeemer as your redemption draws near. May we be this people by God's grace.